Welcome everyone to day two of our A to J Author Supplemental Training. This is Jessica Frank again with the Center for Access to Justice and Technology. Today we're going to be covering three issues in A to J Author 5.0. We'll discuss how to do repeat loops, collecting the number first, and asking to add more at the end. Then I'll talk a little bit about exiting the success process form standard, the exit user doesn't qualify, and how to enable save and resume if you're using Law Help Interactive to host your interviews. Finally, we'll talk about required versus not required and customizing error messages for your end user. So the first topic today is repeat loops, and we'll cover what is a repeat loop, the two ways to do repeat loops, which is collecting numbers first or asking to add more at the end. And then we'll talk about variables within repeat loops and how those work, and then additional resources. So what is a repeat loop? A repeat loop, or a repeat dialog, as it's known, is a series of questions that will display to your end user multiple times based on that user's input. You use a repeat loop if the same type of information needs to be collected several times from the end user. Instead of having to create multiple questions within your guide to interview, you can have one set of questions and then have logic that asks the end user those questions however many times they need. There are two ways, as I mentioned, to make repeat loops in A to J Author, and both have the same outcome. We'll talk about both of these, but you can collect the number of items or the number of people first and then go through the loop or you can ask if there are any more items or people to be added at the end of the loop. The first way to create a repeat loop is to collect the number first. You use this when your end user will likely know right away how many times they need to go through the loop and you ask for that number up front. So in the screenshot here, we're asking how many children do you have? So people, hopefully, always know how many children they have, so they know how many times they need to go through a repeat loop that asks them about their children. There are seven steps for repeat loops done by collecting the number first. The first step is to create the series of questions that will be repeated. So what is your child's name? What is your child's birth? Who is your child's father? Where do they live? What school do they go to? All of those questions that are going to need to be asked about each one of the end user's children, you create that set of questions. Step two, you create a counting variable. The counting variable is specific to A to J author. It's not used in hot docs. And it uh, keeps track of how many times the user has gone through that set of questions. It should always be a number. If the type, if the variable type is not a number, your repeat loop will not work. So make sure that it is a number. And you'll also note on the screenshot here, child count is my repeating variable. I have it as a number and it is not set to repeat. That's important to note. I was troubleshooting someone's repeat loop who wasn't working this week and the issue was that they had the repeat loop or the repeat counting variable set to be a repeating variable. It's not. Child count, the, the counting variable is not set. The little checkbox next to repeat is not checked when you're creating this variable. That's important. Step three is once you have a counting variable, you're going to create your how many questions. This is the jumping off point for your end user. You ask how many, so basically how many times do they need to go through the, the loop. This is the first question in the repeat dialog, but it will not be part of the questions repeated to your end user. So it's the jumping off point and the end user will never see it again. On this how many question, you are going to go to the button section and set the counting variable to one as the repeat option and you put in the counting variable on that button section of the question design window. On this how many question, you're also that number that they're giving you is being stored in a variable, in this, in this example, number of children and you. I'm going to be using that later, so you're going to want to make note of the variable that you use to collect this how many. The fifth step is to identify the counting variable in the counting variable field in the question text section of every question to be repeated. So you'll see here in the screenshot, I'm on the question text section 
you can have the text, we have the learn more, the different help options, and at the very bottom is a field called counting variable. It's only used when you, on the questions that you want to be repeated. It basically marks it for A to J author that this is one of the questions to be shown repeatedly to the end user. You do not identify the counting variable in this question text section on that how many question because we don't want that how many question to be repeated to the end user. If the counting variable is in this counting variable field in the question text section, A to J will include it and keep asking that question to your end user. Here's a screenshot of our map, and you can identify which questions are in a repeat loop by this circle arrow question. So you can see that that how many children question is not part of the loop, but the child's name and the child's birth date are both repeated. And then I triggered this circle arrow symbol by including that counting variable in the question text section but it's a way to see big picture if you've properly um, designated which questions are repeat loop questions and which are not. The sixth step is on the last question to be repeated, on the button section, you select increment counting variable from the repeat options, and you also put the counting variable in this button section. So when the user presses the continue button on this question, A to J author is going to increment um, and increase the counting variable by one to designate that the end user has gone through the loop one time. Finally, the seventh step is to create a condition on the advanced section of the last question to be repeated to compare the number held by the counting variable to the number of items or people that were given to you by the end user. You ask whether the number held by the var counting variable is equal to the number given by the end user. If false, the end user is sent back to the first question of the repeating set and goes through the repeat loop again. If true, the end user is moved out of the repeat loop to the next non-repeated question. So here you can see the logic. If child count equals number of children, go to my next set of questions, which is, do you have any else? Go back to the child's name question and go through the loop again. So it's pretty simple scripting logic. Just make sure to put your variables in bracket and to have a hard return between um, each of your commands. So the if statement, the go to, the else, the go to, and always have an end if, like we talked about last week. The second way to do repeat loops is to ask the end user if they want to add any more at the end. This way has six steps. So, and you use it in cases where the end user likely will not know how many times they need to go through the loop. For example, people might not know how many assets over $100 they have, but they can start going through the list and you ask them, do you have any more, do you have any more, do you have any more? And they keep adding to the list as they go. So there's six ways, uh, six steps to this way. The first step is again, same as the other way of doing repeat loops. You create the set of questions that will be repeated. You then create the counting variable. Here it's asset count, but again, it's a number and repeating is false. Step three, you create a question that leads into the loop, but is not part of the loop. This is the equivalent of that how many question, but this one is asking whether they even want to enter the loop at all. So do you have any assets over $100? If they say yes, as the screenshot shows, this is my yes button that is circled in the light, uh, light yellow, light tan color. On that yes option, you set the repeat options to set counting variable to one, and you designate the counting variable, which here is asset count. If they selected no, so they don't, they don't want to go through the loop, they don't have any assets over $100 to tell you about, so if they select no, it's just normal branching, and it takes them past the loop onto the next set of questions. The fourth step, which is basically the same as collecting the number up front way, is to identify the counting variable in that counting variable field on the question text section of every question to be repeated. Again, you do not identify the counting variable on that do you have any question, just like you did not identify it in the how many question. But for every question you want repeated, you put the counting variable in the counting variable field in the question text section. Again, here is a screenshot of the map. Questions leading into the loop and set, setting the counting variable to one are not identified as repeating, but you can see with the circle arrow again that questions that are part of the loop are identified with that symbol.
There are two parts to step five, one task for the yes button and one for the no. So the last question to be repeated should ask the end user if they would like to add any more. On the yes button, you're going to increment the counting variable in the options field and set the destination question to go back to the first repeating question. So when they press yes, it's going to tally, A to J is going to tally up that they've gone through the loop once, and then the destination is going to be that first question about their asset for this example, so the first repeated question. On the no button, you want to make sure that it's set to normal and they're moved out of the loop. So yes is taking them back into the repeat loop, no is just branching normally and taking them to the next question, and no counting variable is designated for the no button. All right, so variables in a repeat dialog are treated exactly the same way. They're set up as normal, so here the variable child first name TE, it's in a repeat dialog in that it will be asked to the end user multiple times if they need it, multiple times, but it is set up completely normal. So it's a text variable, there's nothing interesting about it. The only difference is that the question is identified as part of a repeat dialog by including the counting variable on that question text section. To hold multiple values, which a repeated variable does, A to J author adds a pound sign and the loop number to the end of the variable name, basically creating new variables each time you go through the loop, which is interesting because you can use that later but all of the values are still held in that one uh, variable. So every time I go through the loop, I'm gonna get a new variable called child first name TE number one, child first name TE number two, child first name TE number 10. I've gone through the loop 10 times. But all 10 of those names are gonna be stored within child name first TE. I can call that out and use the fact that they're all stored within that one variable, for example, to remind the end user what they've told me about. So here in the screenshot, I have that, do you have another question? So if yes, they're gonna go back th into the loop. If no, they're gonna go branch on. But the end user might think, well, which ones have I told you about? They might not be writing them down uh, on a piece of paper next to the computer. So then you, you wanna be able to remind them which ones they've told you about. And you do that in the learn more help section by calling out with a variable macro the name of, or all of the values held within asset name TE. So you can see at the bottom screenshot, you've told me about your percent sign, percent sign, bracket, asset name TE, close bracket, percent sign, percent sign. And how that displays to the end user is that you've told me about your house and car. And each time the end user goes through the loop, it's going to add a value. And then each time, so if they go through the loop again and, and tell you they have a boat, then this learn more help section will say, you've told me about your house, car, and boat. An A to J author automatically adds in commas and the and, the word and, for you. So you don't have to worry about that. You can use the fact that A to J appends that pound sign and the counting, whatever number through the loop they are, to call out specific instances, specific values held within that child's name first TE. So here I'm specifically calling out whatever they've told me was the child's name on the next question, then saying what is Joey's date of birth. Instead of just saying what is the child's date of birth, I can use what they've told me in the previous question each time through the loop and pull it out. So here you would use pound sign, or percent sign, percent sign, bracket, variable name, pound, whatever counting variable you used, close the brackets, percent sign, percent sign, and then each time through the loop, A to J author will only call out the value of that time through the loop that they are. So the first time they go through the loop and they tell you the name is Joey, then they will they will use Joey's birth um, for the date of birth question. The next time they go through the loop and they give you a different name, then they'll get a different name displayed in the bracket or in the macro. Ordinals can be used kind of the same way as um, calling out an instance, but you can use the ordinal function, which we talked about last week, to call out just the instance that you are in in the repeat loop. So what is the name of the third child? What is the name of the fifth child? What is your 17th asset? That kind of thing can be used using the ordinal function and the whatever your counting variable is. And the syntax is here at the top. So I'm going to go into A to J author and show you a repeat loop example. 
So here is an example I made for how to do repeat loops. Here is the first question, the repeat loop of children, the how many question. So how many children do you have? Let's say I have two children and I hit continue. You can see I have my uh, variables and scripting window open here on the left, so you can watch what's going on in the background. So child count is now set to one, setting repeat variable to one, and the repeat variable is child count. I've also said number of children and u equals two. What is the name of the first child? I'm using that ordinal to call out which round of the loop I'm in. Let's say the child's name is John Doe. What is John's birth date? Now it's calling out specifically this instance using that the macro that calls out the child count. And let's say the birth date is the first. What is the name of the second child? So on that last question, there was logic. Let me see here. That was not true. That's why it's right. It was false. So if child count equals number of children, go to child's name. So it was false, and so it sent me to the else, which was to go to child's name, go back into the loop. It also incremented the repeat variable, so now child count equals two because I'm on the second instance of the loop. So if we go back and put in name of the second child, and now it's asking what is Bobby's date of birth. It's using what I've told it is the my child's my second child's name. Let's pick a birth date again. And on this question, when I hit continue, it's going to run logic that's going to test whether child count is equal to number of children and you, which it should be since I've gone I've told it I have two children and I've gone through the loop now two times. So watch the logic to the left here. And as you can see, it is true. And now it's going to the do you have any questions. So it's branched me out of the loop because I've gone through the loop now two times. And it's moving me on to this new set of questions. This set of questions is that do you have any question? Do you have any assets over $100? If I say no, it's going to take me to the end because I don't need to go through the loop. But if I say yes, this is my jumping off point into the repeat loop about assets. What is your first asset over $100 and the estimated value? Say car and $1,000. Do you have any more to add? Do you have another one to add? And here it's asking you what assets have I already told you about? If I click more, it's you've already told me about your car. If I say yes and go through again and say that I have a boat, and the boat is worth $500, and hit continue, do you have another? What assets have I told you about? I've told you about, you've told me about your car and your boat. If I kept going, it would keep adding to this list indefinitely. But if I say no, I don't have any more assets to add, it takes me to the end and I jump out of the loop. A to J author allows you to take your end user out of the guided interview in a couple of different ways. The most common is success process form that moves them, uh, takes them from A to J guided interview back into LHI where they can save their answers, print their document, or email their answers to somebody else. There's also exit user doesn't qualify, so you can take the end user somewhere um, to a different URL if this guided interview is not appropriate for them to use. And there's also exit to save or save and resume, which allows the end user to leave the guided interview and to come back then to the beginning but have their answers pre-filled in at a later point. To do this, the exit to save, you need to have your guided interviews hosted on Law Help Interactive. It's enabled if you wanted to host this on your own website or on your own servers, but you have to have the ability to create an account, and that's why it's exclusively used on Law Help Interactive. LHI allows you to have your end user create an account, save their answer file, come back, click the guided interview answer file, and then come back to the beginning and um, the beginning of their interview and their answers will be pre-populated for them up until the point where they exit it. So let's talk a little bit about how you do it. The first and most common, like I mentioned, is success process form. This is a, you set all of these exiting options in the button section. Um, it's one of the destination buttons that is in brackets. 
when you click the little uh, air, the little folder that allows you to select the destination question, this A to J command, success process form, is one of the options you can select. It takes your end user to Law Help Interactive to get their completed document. They can also save their answers, go back, anything like that. You use this, this button only once per guided interview. There should only be one point where success process form is the destination question for your button, and it should be the very last question of your guided interview. The second most common exiting option is exit user does not qualify. This closes your guided interview for your end user. It will close the pop-up, so it is important to give your end user a little bit of a warning. Don't just have one of your buttons direct your end user off um, and kick them out without giving them a screen like I have here that says, sorry, you don't qualify. If you've made a mistake, you can go back. Otherwise, click exit, which is has exit user doesn't qualify, selected, and then they will leave the interview. If you just put this on a button, like if it if they said they were less than 18 years old, the question was, are you over 18? Yes, no. If no, and you had exit user doesn't qualify as the destination, the interview would just close and give them no warning or no explanation of why it closed. So it's good practice to at least have one screen if, if the user doesn't qualify that it's explaining why they don't qualify and giving them the ability to go back and change their answer. The exit user doesn't qualify option allows, the end, allows you as the author to take your end user someplace else rather than just closing the interview. So here I've added a URL to go to IllinoisLegalAid.org's website and I can have it point to a specific point on the website. Um, you can have it go to Google, literally any website, any URL they can go to and you can direct your end user. So maybe they don't qualify because they make too much money but they might still be income eligible for low bono. You can take them to a website that would direct them to a resource that they could they could qualify for. Or perhaps they're not using the correct form and they really need child support modification instead of a cancellation of child support order. So you can take them to the appropriate section of your website that has that form instead of just closing the interview and providing them no further assistance. The last main exiting option is this save and resume, this exit to save. This is, like I mentioned, an LHI uh, only feature that allows your end user to exit a guided interview partway through, it, uh, partway through, create an account, and then go back later to the beginning but have their answer set pre-populated uh, pre for them. Not all guided interviews have this. So it's not something that you're going to need to do if, for example, you have a shorter guided interview, you don't want to give your end user the option to exit, you just want them to plow through and finish it. If you don't want to have to worry about people coming back or leaving or being confused, you do not have to enable exit, save, and resume. It is an option for you to enable and it, it doesn't require much extra work, um, just a couple extra questions and designating which question is the exiting question, which I'll show you in a minute. But it, it is a nice feature to allow your end user, if it is a long, complicated form that they might get halfway through and realize they need a specific document that they don't have, this allows them to at least save their answers up to that point and then come back later with them pre-populated. So here's how to do it. You create one question that is not linked to any other question in your guided interview. It's a question like my screenshot here that says something like you are now exiting this interview, you'll be redirected to another site where you can create an account and save your answers so that you can return later and complete this interview. If you have made a mistake and wish to continue this interview, click return. To leave this interview and save your answers, click exit. So it's important always, just like the you don't qualify question, to give your end user a way to back out and go back to the interview or change their answer. Here you give them that return button which will take them back to the point where they clicked that exit button at the top of the screen, which is he circled here. When save and resume is enabled, this exit button shows up. If save and resume was not enabled on this guided interview, this exit button would not display to the end user. Sometimes people click around and they might accidentally click this exit button and instead of kicking them directly into LHI to create their account um, and to save their answers, you want to create this standalone question that allows them to return if they accidentally hit that button 
or confirms that they actually do want to exit. So this is a standalone question that is not connected to any other question in my guided interview. And you can see that on the map. There's no arrow pointing, or there's, there's no line connecting it to another question. You identify the single question, whatever you've named it, for example here, three dash save and exit, on the steps page, the steps, steps tab in the start slash exit point. You don't need always to designate a starting question, but if you want save and resume, you need that exit point question to be identified. By having something, some question in this field exit point is what turns on that exit button in the viewer for your end user. On that question, on the button that you enable as exit save and save incomplete form is what takes the end user to LHI to save their answers. So the destination question on the button exit should be exit save incomplete form. On the button where you want to give them the ability to go back and return or resume their guided interview, the destination should be exit resume interview. But as you can see, everything else is set up normally. Repeat options are normal, no counting variable, no variable name. The only thing with save and resume is the destination, either exit resume interview, which takes them back to the point where they clicked that exit button initially, or on the exit button, you have exit save incomplete, incomplete form, and that would take them into LHI. So let's go, before we talk about required questions, let's go back to A to J, and I will show you an example of exiting. So here is a guided interview created with a different ways of exiting. So if we hit continue, we put a name. I now have an avatar. Date of birth. If I put a date of birth that is makes me less than 18 and hit continue, I'm taken to that sorry you don't qualify question. If you make a mistake like, oh really I meant to put um, 1980 instead of 2015, I can go back and change my answer. Hit continue. Now here you can see that it's moved me on. It's checking logic here on the back end. If you look to the left in the scripting box, that first time I went through it, I used the age function that we talked about last week and converted the date of birth, the 10-1-2015 that I initially told it, converted that to an age, a number, and evaluated whether that was less than 18. Because it was, um, because I'm only 26 days old according to my calculations here, it takes me to that, it took me to that you don't qualify question. When I went back, I re-answered the question and changed client DOBDA to 10-1-1980, and then that logic was false and it branched me into the next set of questions. So let's say the incident occurred on the first. It's testing the logic here of whether today minus the incident date is greater than 90 days. If I go back and make it further away than 90 days, I'm again taking that sorry you don't qualify question. A to J evaluated that the incident date minus today's, or today's date minus the incident date is greater than 90, so it's been more than 90 days. I don't qualify to use this guided interview. If I go back. Um, I move back into the question about what type of damages I'm asking for. Here, if I say money, I'm taken to how much money. This is branching me based on logic to a set of questions, how much money. I say $10,000. There's logic, again, that if the money damages are over 5000 take me to that sorry, you don't qualify question. If I clicked exit, like, oops, I went, uh, you know, I don't qualify. Okay, I guess I have to exit. And it's A to J is alerting you as the author because I'm in testing mode that the user would be redirected to another page. And here's the URL that I would, that the end user would be going to. Because this isn't testing mode, it's not actually taking me there. I could test to make sure I have the correct URL. By clicking it, it's going to open up in a new tab what URL my end user would be taken to. I go back and say that I'm asking for less than 5,000. I'm now taken on where I can describe what happened. 
asking for who I'm suing. And now congratulations. This is the last question. You can see I'm right in front of the courthouse. I'm at the last stop sign that says exit. And now here's that get document. If I is the end user and you can see where it's going, when you hover over um, the button, it pops up and it says go to page success process form. If I click this, here's a note to you as the author, user data would be up would upload to server. So I'm actually going to do it because I'm just in preview mode and not actually running this on the server, I'm running a local copy. But this is how you do exiting. So in these options, I had that save and exit. I had that you don't qualify and I have the final congratulations you've completed. If we look at the map, you can see that these questions that that save and uh, exit question is standalone, that that you don't qualify question is not connected to anything else in the map, but everything else branches um, normally with the lines. Required versus not required. So in A to J Author, you can either allow your end user to move on without answering or filling in a field, or you can require it. If you require it, as you can see in the screenshot, it shows up red, if it's not required, it just shows up as black to text the label. So here, first, last, and gender are required, but middle name is uh, permissive. They don't have to fill it in if they don't want, if they don't have a middle name or they don't want to. To make a question required um, prevents your end user from moving on until they fill it out. So if they try to move on, as the screenshot shows, it will highlight the first instance that was required and pop up an error message that says you must type a response in the highlighted space before you can continue. You as the author make a question required on the left by checking that required box. And then that error message that prompts up, that pops up, which by default says you must type a response in the highlighted space before you can continue, can be customized by you as the end user. So for example, you can explain why they can't move on, or you can give them more direction on how to fill it out, something like that. But you can customize the error message by typing in the box that says, if invalid, say. And then you can type whatever you want in that space. It's important to make sure that if you, your end user, when you're thinking of drafting your questions, that some instances, like middle name, not everybody has a middle name, don't make that required because your end user will get blocked and will not be able to move on in their guide interview if they, for example, don't have a middle name. So think about which questions you want to require versus um, allow your end user to bypass. Okay, so this is the end of our training on um, A to J specifically. If you have questions at any time where you're creating guided interviews or hot docs, feel free to reach out to me here with my email and I can help troubleshoot you one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you.